भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Live from Super Soul Farm. This is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show, and welcome to Sunday is our guest day. Every Sunday we bring on people who have an interesting story, and it doesn't get more interesting than Eddie Stern and Mike D from the Beastie Boys. Kastuba, you want to introduce our guests? I would be happy to welcome our guests. Um, first, maybe we'd just say hello. Hey, guys, welcome. Welcome, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so Eddie, you know, these are two uh, people that are very dear to me. Eddie is an esteemed teacher of Ashtanga Yoga. He's the founder and served as the president of the Broom Street Temple, which we'll be talking about today. He's the co-creator, along with Deepak Chopra, of Urban Yogi, a program that trains youth and young adults in yoga and meditation for the express purpose of supporting the reduction of gun violence in Queens, New York. And Eddie is also the author of a really fantastic book called One Simple Thing, A New Look at the Science of Yoga and How It Can Transform Your Life, which is a best-selling book that examines from both a Western scientific perspective and an Eastern philosophical perspective, the underlying mechanisms that make yoga an amazingly effective practice for health, well-being, and spiritual development. Eddie, I am grateful to you in so many ways, and I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And Kostuba, I love your radio voice. Oh, is it different? He's <laughs> got a good voice. Okay. I love listening to Kostuba's voice too. <laughs> Thank you. And Mike D hardly needs an introduction. He is a rapper and founding member of the hugely influential and globally beloved Beastie Boys. He serves at the Broom. He served at the Broom Street Temple as secretary. I generally refer to him as Mr. Secretary. Yeah. Uh, where he also <laughs> practiced Ashtanga Yoga. And as I came to know, Mike had a real connection with the Bhakti Yoga tradition and appreciation for Bhakti and the culture stemming from it and from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is what Wisdom of the Sages is all about, and a love for Vrindavan and things like that. So we're looking forward to speaking about all that kind of stuff. Mike, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And I just want to say, I want to echo what Eddie said. I think you have a great um, voiceover, radio voice. And I, I, I see you, Kastir, yeah. maybe going into children's books. <laughs> audio children's books i thought you were going to say like we could yeah. rap together or something like that no no oh <laughs> listen that's a separate discussion and okay frankly, no that i'm not going to entertain that at this point All right, <laughs> but children's but book it is children's don't books bring my rap this audition age, Shuba. there's yeah. always children and they're always going to need books and in this day and age a lot of times that means audiobooks so it's a far more lucrative path for you okay so I mean, maybe I can't be cool, but I can at least be rich. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm well, <laughs> I don't know. Isn't, isn't taking care of the children cool? You're right. It's That's actually okay. the coolest thing. Thank you. And Thank you for feel good in your soul. So Thank you. I'm going to use the lingo of another tradition I come from. It's a real mitzvah here <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I've given you this. Thank so you're welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, <laughs> Rahu. I have to jump in with a couple questions. Well, first of okay. all, Mike D, I'm not sure if you know me, but you know, it's between all four of us, we all sort of hung out in the Lower East Side. And, right. um, and we're all sort of approximately the same age. And I don't know if you remember this like I do, Mike, but you and I had a special moment together and maybe it was only special for me. It was at the Ritz. Wait, was, is, was this within the confines of legality or outside? It was legal. It was legal. Oh, it was a okay. special moment. You looked at me. I looked at you. We had a magical connection. Hear me out on this one. We were on the, at the Ritz. It was the License to Ill kickoff show. I was on the side of the stage. I was singing along like crazy. You looked at me. You took off your neck thing. You threw it to the Not side. Not just any neck thing. You know, the big VW neck thing. That was yours. Right? Yeah, <clears throat> that was mine. Landed that, on my foot. I mean, well, Landed it was bestowed. It, truthfully, the VW thing was bestowed upon me by, from Adam and Adam, my bandmates. They literally showed up in my apartment one day and they were like, you're wearing this. But anyway, that's a separate. <laughs> okay. It was really cool. It was really cool at the time. We were probably all 19 or 20. Landed on my foot. And I thought he either threw that at me, 
like, hey, brother, take it, run with it, mm -hmm. pass the torch. Or maybe just threw it. Should I steal it? Should I steal this thing? And I didn't. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if there was a connection. Anyway, you that was the honor You took the honorable path. I took the honorable path. I didn't steal it. Or it was the cowardly path, like, I'm scared I'm going to get caught, and they do have bouncers. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was me on the side of the stage. I remember it. You may not. And then we saw you again in L.A. play on that same tour. Because um, we were on tour. And here's the million-dollar question. Did you ever hear of Youth of Today? No, I mean, I heard of Youth of Today. I never got to see I never saw you guys. But, I mean, because you guys were probably more peers of Murphy's Law. Yes. I'm thinking, right? Yes. You must have, like, yes. Or, yes. for that matter. It's okay. Me and Kostuba have the joke that yeah. says. Actually, well, I'm trying to think. It'd be, I mean, I guess it would be pre cro -Mags. Anyway, but now I have a question for you. All right. Weird question. So we used to have a studio. It was actually Adam Yauk's studio on Canal Street, all the way on the west side, where yes. we worked for a bunch of years in New York City. Um, and in the, the control room, we actually had windows. And when, you know, you're working a lot of days in a row in New York City, you kind of like, there's, you're working on, mo on music there's the magical moments where everything comes together really quickly and it's, you know, all seemingly divine and incredible. And then there's, yeah. you know, the other 364 days of the year. Yeah. Right. And um, so there's a lot of looking out the window and we would look out the window and then there was a, a guy on a roof practicing, I would say, I mean, not knowing enough about the practice, but I'd say either Qigong or Tai Chi some some sort of uh yeah, that, movement and we thought we thought ray that was you no it was lou reed no it wasn't no because lou, lou and laurie were across the street it was, it was a different building let me get this straight the beastie boys looked out the window on a divine day and saw me doing qigong or at least saw somebody that some they sort said, of movement that might be ray practice. capo yeah <laughs> Just say it was you, Robert. Well, it was, I'm very it was, honored. Yeah, it was, you. It, it was thought to be you. And that's when all the music came together. Right that's when it all on. came together. So in no, one sense, you're saying I'm responsible for the Sabotage <laughs> single. This is, is that Sabotage is quite a bit here? before this, but uh, uh, yes, that you may be somehow in taking in this visual <laughs> of the supposed you in mid <laughs> Energy That's flow. that guy from that weak hardcore band. That's <laughs> and second generation. Now, wait, can, can I can can we contextualize, or maybe your listenership already knows the whole history? But I just I, one of the things that is there's a few interesting historical things to me about hardcore in New York City, which is that one, and you you alluded to it, Ray, which is that it it really took place in a very small geographic area. I mean, even though a lot of the bands were from, like say Murphy's Law from Astoria, a lot of, a lot of Astoria hardcore. Lots. Were you guys from Jersey. Astoria? Where were you from, Ray? I was from Connecticut, from Connecticut, but then we moved to, uh, our family had an apartment in the West Village that was rent controlled. Mm -hmm. So me and uh, Porcel, AKA Paramananda, moved there in 1985 or 86 for 200 wow. bucks a month. So we were on West 15th Street and 8th Avenue. Uh -huh. Okay, so Chelsea, and you'd walk across town. Or but we used to like, like, bus, or but like Costuba, yeah, like Costuba though, we used to come up from the city on weekends to go to the matinees. And I saw, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, and I'm gonna share this with you, the first hardcore band, because back then I grew up in Connecticut. We had no peers. You guys were cool. You're from the city. You had people showing you stuff, giving you records to listen to. We had nobody out there in Sydney, in Connecticut. So we were just going to the city and we'd look at the back of the Village Voice. We'd go to the Peppermint Lounge, we'd go to Danceteria, go to the Mud Club, try to figure out what's cool, what's not cool. So one night, I, w I just heard a, fact, a crazy name called Haircut 100. That must be punk. <laughs> so I went to see Haircut 100 That's awesome. at the Ritz. <laughs> and the next day, the next day was another punk sounding name called the UK Subs and the Young and the Useless. There you go. And that was my first hardcore show. 
And uh, a girl I that, that I went with at the time saw you guys, or were you in The Young and the Useless? No, no, I, I, Adam was in The Young and the Useless. We, we were Beastie Boys, we, but we played, hard, we played hardcore matinees at CBGB's a couple I, of times. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, anyway, I guess I'm giving, I'm guessing. Um, anyway, but no, but my, but my point though is like, it was it's like confined. what you alluded to, it was this fairly, like out of all of Manhattan, it was kind of like, right, Eddie, am I delusional in this? Like, I mean, Mud Club was maybe the outlier because it was like down in Tribeca, but most of it, it was like A7 on 7th Street and Avenue A, 171, uh, which was, uh, and the Second Rat Cage. Avenue. So, was the rat cage eventually moved to 9th street by 2nd avenue but originally it was on avenue a by 11th street so it's like a fairly small geographic zone and like what you talked about right when we grew up in at that time to find out what was going on you had to put you had to physically go there you had to be in right, proximity yeah. of what was happening there was no nobody had a facebook page to tell them what the fuck was going on so you you weird? yeah so anyway you so you, find out to, you just go there and you but the amazing thing is we'd all find out. Like it wasn't that, it wasn't that difficult, right? You just find out. Yeah. Billy's voice. And, well, and you think Billy's about, voice. Eddie, what were you saying? I was at that show, the UK subs and Young and Useless show. At I was there, I was there too. That was, a, that was the Young and, by the way, that was the Young and Useless's big break opening up for the UK show, subs. <laughs> Turned out it, nothing really broke, but it, if there was <laughs> a big break. It was a big break for me because I thought was it. The, the girl I was with said, oh man, you should just start a band like these guys. And I was like, I went home from that weekend so inspired. I remember what happened too. Can I share a humiliating story? I started because- Your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I just started moshing for the first time, but I didn't have the inside information about moshing, which was if you were from out of town, you're not allowed to mosh. And so I was like running and slamming world. into everybody. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Immediately I was picked out like, like a weak fish about a bunch of sharks. And I was grabbed by the neck by John Watson. Mm -hmm. And he was ready to punch my lights out. And I just said, I'm sorry, I'm new to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, can I tell you why I love this story? Not, not, not oh. hey, because you're sharing your vulnerability with us, which I do appreciate in, oh. in this book, but I, I think look, that's, why be ashamed of that? That's the whole point. We only learn <laughs> by somebody mm. elder than us in a practice. Really, he was just practicing an ancient tradition. He, it, he's it was, it was he's an elder initiation. to you in the practice of moshing. <laughs> He's called and, he and he was refining your moshing skills. You could call it disciplic succession, so to speak. Exactly. So he, yeah, he and, took and I on, will, he I, took on the guru role or sensei role of like, yeah, he refined your practice in that moment. But I, important note here, my esteemed bandmate, Adam Horvitz, also known as the King Ad Rock and I, we, I think we sort of both feel like John Watson, um, of formerly of of antidote, and I guess wait wait he was was agnostic he was front. A, he was the first agnostic front singer. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So briefly, John, we we kind of credit him with being the first mosher in New York City. He is the seminal mosher. I think it's safe to say. And he's so, a, he's a regular listener to I our mean, show. I mean, not seminal, and I think maybe first. So John, please yeah. you know join in on the chat if you're listening. He may be here right um, now. He because be, we, Adam like and I were like, because we, we remember there's, there was a, I think it was the, for maybe, it was one of the first three agnostic front shows, I believe, or might even been, was, was he in a band before agnostic front? I don't think so. I think he was only with agnostic front for just a couple shows. Listen, and they were very important shows, guys, because in one of these shows, Adam and I were there, Orvis and I are there, and in the audience, and at some point, they're like doing some song. I'm not that, I apologize, Steve Martin and, you know, Harley, whoever else, and any other members of Agnostic Front, I'm not that versed. Vinny. In a, Vinny. Vinny Stigma, I'm not that versed in Agnostic Front. Uh, in fact, let's be real, I'm not fucking versed at all in Agnostic Front. Um, but, um, 
they, I remember, so they, they're playing, they're playing their set and at a certain point they get to this song and they go to like the dirge, like the creepy crawl part. And then the, 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 the guitar player throws down his guitar. It was Vinny, Vinny Stigma. Vinny was, Stigma was the guitarist. Yes. Like, so Vinny Diego Stigma played bass. Oh, that's right. Diego was in the band. That's right. Diego, Diego played Diego bass throw, in, Diego in Diego's Ray. the first one. Diego throws, Diego throws down his bass, starts to mosh. Vinny Stigma <laughs> throws down his guitar. Huh. Starts to mosh. <laughs> John Watson throws down the mic. Starts to mosh. Then the drummer throws down the drumsticks. Leaves his drum kit. That's called, it, at that point, it's just a fight. It's, it's, <laughs> it starts to, it, no, I'm, I don't know. I reckon it as one of the best theatrical hardcore moments okay. <laughs> ever. In and that history. drummer would have been Ray Bees of Warzone. The drummer was Ray Bees. Oh, right. Yeah. So anyway, what a cast please, of characters. John Watson, or as we also like to refer to you, John Wallace. Um, John Wallace. And I don't know why we would call you. It was sort of always funny to us on tour, we'd say John Wallace. Anyway, oh no, that's right, because we tried to explain to Russell Simmons, hip hop entrepreneur. I really shouldn't have brought him up on this podcast because there's a lot of dark clouds Whatever, over cool. that man. So, <laughs> Whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but he would pronounce it well. Nonetheless, there was a moment of like you know when we, we in our trajectory when we were like we were with Russell all the time and and we were trying to explain he, you know Russell there was a lot of cultural, you know there were a lot of like there was a lot of cultural exchange between Russell and us and one of the things we tried to explain to Russell was about moshing and we'd be like we tried to explain to him about this guy John Watson, and he pronounced it Wallace. And he was like, he's like, oh yeah, you know, you do. I remember, like, we were one time we were practicing to go a tour, and he was like, no, 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 you got to do that John Wallace shit. <laughs> anyway, okay. awesome yeah. Now, gentlemen, I, I'm going to desperately try to sorry, drag I, this conversation yeah, we, somewhere we've to. We've gone <laughs> way off. We've <laughs> gone <laughs> into. I was going to really. And Eddie will attest. You know, in our path towards elevated thinking, we spend a lot of our time in non-elevated topics. It's a it's a springboard, <laughs> that's the truth. and that's and that's how we consciously <laughs> applied it today. Now, now let's. Eddie, you were Eddie. mentioning. I have a question for Eddie, and and Mike was mentioning <laughs> that in that time, it was hard to find things. You'd have to go and find them yourself, and even a decade and a half later or so, the Broom Street Temple was like that, right? The Broom Street Temple was this. There was no advertisement for the Broom Street Temple or Ashtanga Yoga New York. True, good point. Um, it was it was. I, I was, Radha Swami encouraged me to practice asana. And I was 14 years of brahmachari walking back into the downtown New York world and trying to find a place that I could relate to. And, uh, you know, and I'm not meaning to be critical of other yoga places, but just like a place that was kind of, that I felt was really in touch with the tradition. And someone recommended that I check out uh, Eddie's place. And I walked in there and it was, um, it was amazing that it, the mood in there, it felt like I was walking into some old school in India. And there was a, not just like a little altar with some pictures on it, there was a serious Ganesh temple in that place. And I immediately started thinking, this sounds like a place for me. I was first taught there on that day by, uh, by Eddie's wife, Jocelyn. And then I met Eddie shortly after and immediately I felt, okay, here's a kindred spirit. So Eddie, could you just share with us a bit about how you started that place? What was your conception? Why you brought in a real serious temple like that? And maybe we can also discuss how that kind of became the Broom Street Temple. And it was more, Eddie, before you jump in, like, because I was in LA doing a stunga, and Kostuba was like, you got to check out this place. I cook, I, I cook uh, idlis and uh, uh, dokla. <laughs> and I was like, what? At the yoga studio, you're making dokla in the mm. yoga studio? What the hell are you doing? What are you talking about? Yeah, and they worship Ganesh there. I was like, what? What was going on on Broom Street? Uh, I gave my office to uh, Go Stuba and we turned it into a small kitchen. But uh, how did it start? Well, you know, when I first went to India to learn yoga, um, I spent a month, this is 1988, 89, I spent a month or so at the Shivananda Ashram I'm doing a training program there. And then I traveled for three and a half months with two friends. And we went by bus and by train from, the, from Trivandrum, basically, in, in Kerala, South India. 
all the way up to Kathmandu by bus and by train. And then we came back down from Kathmandu to Delhi, to Rajasthan, and then um, back to Bombay where I flew home from. And um, what we did was we wanted to go on a yatra. So we, would, we were just going to all the, you know, the big and the small temples along the way, all the way up till Kathmandu. And whenever we would roll into a, a new city, we would of course find the temple. And then every day we'd go there and we'd roll out our straw yoga mats and we would do our sadhana there each day in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, some asanas, pranayama, meditation and chanting. And then we would have darshan of all the deities. And after two or three days, we'd move on to the next temple. And we did that for like a good solid three months, three and a half months. And so yoga really came alive for me in the temples of India. Like it wasn't, yoga didn't come alive for me because there weren't many yoga schools in Manhattan back then. And, and I had no idea that I would ever start a yoga school of my own, but I thought that, you know, what I wanted to have in New York, wherever I was, was that feeling that I had in India of what it felt to practice in a holy place, in a sacred place. Right. So that when we actually ended up building our first school in 1995, uh, that's what we did. We built a small temple. We had a small Ganesha, the white one. And that's where I did puja every day until we moved to Broom Street in 2000. And um, at that point, I asked Patabi Joyce, uh, who was my guru, if he would give us blessings to install, uh, do a, prana, a proper prana pratishta of a deity in New York, in the new place. And he said, yes, you should install Ganesh. And he told us which type of Ganesha we should do. And we had it carved in Mysore. And we shipped over um, something like uh, 700 or 800 pounds of stone and brass deities and worship stuff. And um, yeah. in 2001. And um, the, you know, and we never advertised for the yoga school or for the, the Broom Street Temple until around 2004, 2005, when we finally put up a single web page of what we were doing. But one of the things that-, um, that It was a pretty um, bare uh, web page too. <laughs> said to me that when you start teaching, this was in 1993, before I was teaching, when you start teaching, don't advertise. If you're mm -hmm. active, people will come find you. And if you're not any good, then people won't come. So mm -hmm. either way, so we never advertised, and it was all word of mouth, and uh, that's how it that's how it was. We liked it that way; it was nice. It was an amazing atmosphere there. It was really beautiful. It was super cool. It was and, and and so when I walked in there, I saw yeah, it was like kind of this underground place. It was even a little hard to find. A lot of times, people try to find it; they couldn't find the door. They would just walk past it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And and so I walk in there, and it, for me, again, coming up from being a monk for fourteen years, it was this really cool place. It felt like India. Um, but like, I was kind of re-entering society in, in, in the same neighborhood where I was as a teenager. And That's always uh, a tough little transition. Yeah, well, well it was wait, kind of, mean, to be honest. So wait, cause, yeah. one, cause I, I'm trying, I think it, I, I want to understand, cause actually I don't yeah. know, I don't really know totally your trajectory. So where, where did you grow up and then you, and then you went to off on pilgrimage to India or what was the Well, trajectory? when I was 21, you know, all my teenage years, I was there in that New York hardcore scene from 81, 82, up until uh, 87. And where did you grow and up? It, but where did you grow I grew up, up in Pleasantville, New York, just like just north of the city. Uh -huh. So is, is that like Westchester or? I, yes. I mean, I'm sorry, pardon my ignorance of New yes. York yes. geography, it, but that's what yes. happens to, to Manhattan, you know, New York I City dwellers. We're very, we're a very self-centered bunch. <laughs> I could never get Eddie above 14th Street. <laughs> right. Because he grew up on McDougal Street. Yeah. But, but, um, but yeah, so, so right. when I was 21, I became a brahmachari monk in the Hare Krishna movement. And from that point, I was traveling. I, I just disappeared from New York. And a lot of that time was spent in India and in ashrams and studying and practicing and, and, and moving around. Uh, so now I come back to New York. I'm a married man. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I didn't go to college or anything. So I've got this background in um, bhakti, really. Um, and, and, I, and I step into that place. And now I'm seeing a lot of the people that were my age from my scene, but like they're all practicing yoga at this place, including you, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the first time I met you, Mike, was um, at Irving Plaza 
I think you and Adam Yauk walked up to me and handed me a flyer. I was up, you know, where Tim Somer and, and, and Jack Rabbit would DJ mm -hmm. on the balcony. And I was there talking to them and you came up and you handed me a, a flyer for some show that you're doing. Right. Like we, were, we, were getting our, we were getting our young hustle on. That's right. Yeah. And, and, um, and so now I see people like you, you're there in your, your what do you call the board shorts or whatever, you know, yeah. uh, you know, doing some serious, you know, asana in there. And, 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 uh, and, you know, a lot of, I don't want to name drop here, but you know, like a lot of really like some of the most famous people in the world, you know, in terms of music or art or, you know, movies or everyone in there had some interesting story. Mm -hmm. And well, I think um, there were a lot of high, I would put it like there, I think there were a lot of really it, it an interesting combination of there were a lot of high achieving people there, but a lot of people who have very interesting stories that, you know, they, they had a connection to being in New York as well. You know, there was yes. a reason that they were there. They felt a call, whether they were from there or had immigrated there, they, they felt a calling to be, you know, in New York City, which we all know is not difficult. Hence, I mean, which is, sorry, which is, which is difficult living, right? Right, right. Living in New York City, it's not easily... Uh, if Done. you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, they say. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so my question is, what brought you there? How did you end up at, at um, Young York anymore? Uh, I, so I, I was, you know, I was a bit older. I was, uh, or, you know, let's, let's see, let's trace it. So there's, there's me on the stage at the Ritz where Ray is on the side <laughs> having his... <laughs> Personal moment. Having, hey, you know what, are having I, our I moment. I don't know if anyone on this call has seen the animated tv series avatar uh -huh. it's like a, a kid's cartoon but it's actually kind of cool it takes place in easter it's sort of how would you explain it eddie it's sort of like it you know it's it's versed a bit in eastern mysticism yeah totally um and so my kids watch it when they were little and i was always like wow this is kind of cool it's like it's you know it's like a superhero cartoon with, with sort of like a a, a combination of buddhism uh, Tao Chi, you know, I Ching, like whatever, Taoism, Buddhism, different isms. A lot of superpowers. A lot of superpowers, but you know, a lot of cities. Basically, like like the yeah. subtext of of Avatar is is are are the are cities, right? And yeah. uh, <clears throat> anyway, so I'm just saying this, this scene, right, of me <laughs> throwing the VW to you is like a scene from the cartoon <laughs> Avatar. <laughs> You received the superpower. You got a uh, VW symbol, the magic, the, the city. It's like a holy grail kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, all right. So how did I find Eddie? I think, you know, I, so I, anyway, I, I went from that point of, I, I was this, you know, we went from, first off, actually to give full context, pre-hardcore, we were like, and I think Eddie, maybe you were too, or maybe I'm like just slightly older than you, but we, we are, 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 are we the same age? I forget. But anyway, we, we were these kids that were going out to clubs at way too young an age, but just to see music. Like we really loved, you know, we were going to see bands like Gang of Four and The Slits. Um, um, and then we discovered The Bad Brains. And then that was like hardcore. And that was super exciting because they were like faster and, and then all of a sudden, I remember like my first Stronger. moshing, my first able to jump moshing, over totally. what's that? My, my first moshing story <laughs> was, was we went to Peppermint Lounge to see Black Flag. And I don't know if anyone on this call was there, but um, it was an incredible, Dez was still the singer and it was an incredible mm. show and we loved Black Flag, but we were really intimidated like, and all these people I know that, that eventually started, like similar to your story, really, all these people I know who started bands were at that show. And, right. but we were pushed up against the back wall because <clears throat> first off, Pepperland Lounge was this club in Midtown. So we were outside of the, our, our geographic, our geographic right. comfort zone. And, and, and it was like a bigger like venue, right? And we're pushed up against the back wall because all these kids from DC, like, you know, who I then later would become come to know like Ian Mackay and his brother Alec, like Ian Mackay, of course, from Fugazi and before that Minor Threat and before that Teen Idols. Um, all, all these, like this whole contingency, Henry, who then would go on, who was at that time Henry Garfield, who would become Henry right. Rollins, who would become the Black Flag singer. They all came up from DC in a couple of vans and were in the audience. And they had this attitude, like, we're going to show these New York kids 
how this is done. And so <laughs> right. they how old were are you? All, 14 years old? I was like 15 or so. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe 14, yeah, 15, something like that. And so then, uh, yeah, 15, I think. So anyway, 14 or 15. So then when, when like all Black Flag starts playing, which is, which is mind blowing, then all these dudes who know how to mosh <laughs> start moshing and we're up against the back wall also with all these girls that we were going to shows with at the time and it was like this weird thing where it kind of connected to us like whoa, whoa and it was like all of a sudden it, the energy shifted because it did become a male dominated like hardcore that was the thing like downtown was cool and it was like we we were actually there were a lot of girls that were cooler than us that taught us a lot of things and then but it's weird it was an Hardcore is this like nest of, that's largely filled with testosterone and it fills that need of teen testosterone, you know, mm. like whatever. Teenage boys are like a, a testosterone factory and it, it like feels like it like satisfies that output, but it, it to the exclusion of women, I think, um, completely. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, but But that was like a big... <laughs> Uh, turning point. So I'm trying to get to Eddie. So yes. then that was hardcore. So then we go from that to having lice. Then we become totally emerged in rap music because that hardcore, honestly, to us, we outgrew it. Like, and and sorry for you hardcore fans who are going to hate on me listening to this. But you know, that, like musically, musically hardcore is exciting. It's also musically limited. It's not like hardcore was never a music that, that there were never groups that broadened out where it could go. Maybe to the exception of like Bad Brains and to some some degree like Black Flag. Um, well, I guess, you know, a minute, man, there, there, there are groups that definitely <laughs> did different. Okay. So I'm, I'm contradicting myself, but the, <laughs> it was, it never went too, too far sideways. Right. Which we get it. We get it. I get yeah. it. To me personally got boring. Um, so rap was far more revolutionary and interesting, um, and just straight up relevant to us. And so that, that became our whole world. Um, and then cut to, we have like all these big records we'd moved to california and gone back to new york or whatever and then we we kind of moved back to new york and then through my wife at the time tamara davis as she was my first asana teacher so to give her oh credit, i didn't know that uh she she started uh teaching me and you know whatever i think like a lot of people i was you know i was on tour all the time i was probably living on adrenaline i was you know i probably had uh, you know i was in an adrenalized um I think, I guess, Eddie, maybe I'm saying this right. Like, like my, I, there was a lot of cortisol going on in my body, right? Probably because I wasn't really sleeping. I was like not sleeping and performing all the time and working on records all the time. So I, I though I was in the moment, I also had no, uh, nothing that felt um, so the end, I think I still actually, now I'll go, now here'll be my vulnerable moment. You know, I still had a lot of suffering from, uh, as a teenager in New York City, just of like crazy shit going on around me and my dad dying when I was really young and, you know, and I'm kind of having to, you know, being like this, being in this weird role where it's like my, my older brothers had moved out of the house. They were older, much older, so they weren't there. And it was just like my mom and myself in, in this house in New York City. And it's weird, you know, mm. when you're in that role so i had anyway i had all this like feelings without any system to uh process 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 or make me to sort of like deal with the the chemistry set inside the body and inside the mind gotcha Um, and touring with the beastie boys wasn't that process well it was great i mean in terms of the satsang i mean really i'd say actually beast boys it is an incredible story this is my avatar episode that i would pitch for the beastie boys is that it really is a story of satsang. Like we, we helped each other. We actually hmm. did somehow in multiple, multiple ways help uplift each other. We enriched each other's lives. Um, and okay. through that, I'm incredibly grateful and indebted uh, always, you know, and, and which as we all know, often in groups of young men, usually goes the other, especially young white men, usually goes the other way. It usually goes down, not, not, Okay. it doesn't end up being elevated. Um, so anyway, then, yeah, I was just, we were looking, um, so then I was practicing yoga and then I just kind of like, like what you're talking about, cause sort of like, there's no advertising. There's no, you know, like Eddie said, he's not doing any 
he, he's not doing any outreach. It was kind of like this word, like, oh, if you're, if you're really, sh if, you're, if you're really serious, you're going to go check out this dude, Eddie Stern. And I was very intimidated at first because I go, um, that's when you were on, uh, on Broadway in Houston in the, and, and I was intimidated for two reasons, Eddie. One, because that building is where Roar Cassettes was. Ooh. <laughs> I don't, were they still that way, Eddie? I can't hear you for some reason, your audio. Yeah, that was uh, Roar Cassettes was on the fourth floor. We were on the sixth floor. Nick Cooper, whose father started Roar Cassettes, he was my classmate. And uh -huh. also, he, um, and you knew Nick really well. Or, yeah. Was, so, uh, and, his, and his brother, Lucas, ended up taking over Roar Cassettes um when nick but do you do but you getting that space at 611 broadway was that at all related to roar not at all related to roar so for all who don't okay. know roar cassettes was putting out hardcore punk rock cassettes back they put out the bad brains bad cassette brain. which was like a huge thing for us and so but my point is like i was kind of intimidated going to your shala when you were at 611 broadway because it was like okay legitimate businesses are there like i thought you must be really real deal guys are real <laughs> <laughs> got crate and barrel down at the bottom of the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like very yeah. legit. Yeah, you know, I felt kind of like going to like a doctor's, if like, you know, I, I was a little worried, like maybe walking into Eddie's shawl, like I was like going to like a doctor's appointment or something, like for the first time. <laughs> anyway. But, and then I walk in, it is, you know, it is, there is a seriousness because it was you know, it's silent, there's no music playing, it's just that you just hear the sound of people's breath of their, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, just Ujaya breathing. And it's definitely it's, gravity. And it's sweaty, it's sweaty, and everybody's, and it's, there's a level of, of focus there. Um, I don't know, I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen a room with that, uh, that uh, unanimous level of, uh, uh, focus amongst practitioners mm. prior to that. And then right. Eddie, Eddie quickly tumbled me into Madonna. Okay. True story. <laughs> tumbled you into Madonna? Tumbled me Elaborate, into Madonna. Um, Utita Hastagana Pustasana yeah. kind of like uh, knocked yeah. you into her? Kaprasana, yeah. fly back. Well, I'm sure they ultimately is my fault, right? I should have been rooted in my feet. <laughs> my connection to the earth was not strong enough, guys. I, I failed myself and Eddie and Madonna all in one <laughs> fail swoop. <laughs> you failed Madonna. <laughs> but anyway, but then, and then that was the beginning of, uh, and it's also so, one of those so, things, um, and, and the other part of the story, yeah. truthfully, is that with Eddie and I, it's, it's in, New York City is a very interesting place because it's big enough that even though Eddie and I were in this same scene and we're the same age and we have all these mutual friends, we somehow hadn't, we had never become friends when we were teenagers, but mm. you still have this familiarity then when you meet and you're, you know, at this point, what, Eddie, we're probably both like around, I was probably late 20s. I'm yeah. Thinking. And this was, in the, this was 1997 or 1998. 1998. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because we were making, I was in New York because we were working, we were making Hello Nasty when I was going to. That was, you were recording that on Mod. Yeah, exactly. That, where, where, where we were in Moby's building on Mott Street recording. Next door to Moby's building. Yeah. yeah. Did you know, did Mike, did you go to India? You're, you're a former yeah. bandmate in Chop Shop. No, Moby was never in Chop Shop. Oh, he was never in Chop Shop. So in what, was, what was your band? What was your band together? Oh, we didn't have a band together. We just played music together. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, I, I, I misspoke. Moby, I apologize. We had a drumming circle together on Mott Street, if you would. What? Don't what? share that. Don't ever share that with anyone, Eddie. I like you being vulnerable, but that's <laughs> not, don't that's too tell far. people that. <laughs> Go <laughs> set up. <laughs> Mike, did you go to did you go to India and, and, and study at all or yeah, so then uh let's see actually I think it was before I met Eddie, I had I had done my first trip to Vrindavan, I believe. Um and I I, I ended up really actually sort of whatever by 
grace, accident, whatever you want to call it, at, at the Neem Karoli Baba Ashram um, in Vrindavan. Sham, that means Shamdas, through Shamdas, you Try to were loosely invited through Shamdas, to but I wasn't yet, uh, at that time, I wasn't studying with Sham. I wasn't, and I didn't have this tight relationship with Shamdas that I would go on to have. Wow. So okay. it was sort of kind of like, a, we showed up there, and this guy who at the time was the manager of the Ashram Bhaskar was like, um, it's like, oh, yes, you know, he sort of like looked me up and down and, and he was kind of like, oh, yes. Hmm. Yes, like, Sham. And he sort of nodded. He said, like, Sham Das, he knew that I had this connection to Sham Das. And then he was like, okay, you stay here. Yeah, yeah. He gave a little, in, he gave, he gave a little head wag. Yes, uh -huh. license to L, please come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and, no, it was a new, and it was a great, here. that was like, that was this my first ex experience of being in sort of a humble uh, spiritual compound and then and also just being in Vrindavan and then walking down the street where uh, like even just seeing these different sort of uh, holy people like Ch this guy Choto Maharaji who was this, this you know dreadlocks were down to his feet and did sort of seva to these cows every day and these cows would come and be like lap dogs to him i mean there were a lot of amazing experiences um in that in what that year was that my trip um i'm gonna say say that was probably right before meeting eddie so like in, like in the 96 um. around there because then then because then i would then i would go back to India after meeting Eddie and I would go to uh, study with Guruji and Sharat in Mysore. Um, and then I'm around that same trip. Then, and then I went up north to just, uh, I'd say study with Sham Das, but study is a, not quite the right word because, you know, Sham is just like this all encompassing being with him. And this is Sham Das. You'd always say, like, hang out, right? Yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, it's the practice of hanging out. And I think he, he was the only person, I think, I think that's part of what my conjecture of what happened, it, it, you know, the, the Neem Karoli the Baba Satsang, I think so the reason that so many people had such a hard time from that scene readjusting to, to being back in the West was there was no, there wasn't a practice. The practice mm. was hanging out, you know, but right. they were hanging out in this incredible beings presence and and that so that and that was transmittable but it wasn't uh practicable i guess right. and the Hard only one that's the only one that i think uh, you know I, i'm not misspeaking here because there's certainly a lot of people who know this history way better than me but i think you know, shamdas was one person who stayed when everybody yeah. freaked out after uh Karoli baba aka maharaji uh left his body most of the westerners freaked out and went back home and were like what the hell do we do now? Right. Um, um, but Sham stayed and he, you know, he self, you know, he taught himself Hindi, taught himself Rajvasi, taught himself Sanskrit, um, and just became completely immersed in, and sort of, he continued this practice of hanging out, um, which, you know, sounds like I'm belittling it a little, which I'm not. I, it, it's, well, he it, was a scholar and, you know, yeah, and he was, and he was an issue. He put a lot of work into this. It wasn't like just hanging out. He, I mean, he really would, he would go out, he was a true seeker and would go and have the darshan of these incredible people that I don't know that how many people would, I mean, I wrote, there's countless days that I spent riding around on the Honda, on the esteemed Honda Hero motorcycle. Okay. Uh, <laughs> with Shandas, you know, going to these little tribal villages that are not on any map whatsoever to speak of that where you, you find then in this thing, you then you'd find this little Krishna temple in the middle of nowhere with these incredible women and here's this one amazing old you know pujari or whatever and and uh you know they were amazing they were all every every moment every day was it was an amazing lesson right you know but you eddie went there before but you went there before shamdas you just had some inkling or some draw toward neem karoli baba or vrindavan yeah yeah because i didn't think i sort of heard about 
New Curly Baba, and then I was like, all right. I started, I felt I was like in this weird thing, like, uh, and and you know, truthfully, we we'd been on tour for like I'm trying to remember, like it was like 18 months, and then we had a break, and I was just like, all right, I'm going to India. Like I need I need this is like I was in a weird place, just um, kind of like what I was talking about. Like there, I didn't you know my, my adrenaline's wherever. I was like I I need to try to figure this out I didn't have kids yet so I didn't have like that root of like I was just like I'm gonna go um did you know where you were going to, or where, and, yeah, no and then yeah well Vrindavan was just no that was things and then I we just kind of and, and ended up and here I am like in like I was like in tourist Rajasthan like I was in every place that like sort of I didn't want to be right um and then but then I knew about Vrindavan and then I knew like so you know then I someone had said like oh you know you could probably go stay at the Neem Karoli Baba ashram so I was just like okay and literally showed up there um and again that was pre it's not like i could at that that time i couldn't email bosker and say dear esteemed manager no Mario, right. i'd love to stay have, I i'm gonna book this online on uh yeah vrbo.com yeah i'd like to book the enlightenment suite the enlightenment suite <laughs> uh your ashram you know I just, I, <laughs> I'll take the which uh, uh, option. Yeah. I remember the biggest upgrade I got once after being there for a couple of days was, uh, the, there was a nice, uh, uh, what's his name? Kabir Das, a nice elderly couple that were, that were devotees of Maharaji. They, they said, and it was, it was December. It was really cold. And the, so the cold shower in the morning was really cold. Uh, and then they they schooled me in getting the, the hot coil to uh, put in the big coil. to put in, in the, the big bucket of water. So before for those who are uninitiated into this program, India before the running hot water, you would buy this thing that sort of looked like a hair curler, and yeah. you'd, it'd, it'd be a plug. It's probably the most dangerous thing. Yeah, ever. I was going to say it's for anyone listening. It's definitely not UL approved. Like there's yeah. nothing safe about this. <laughs> You all. plug it in and put it in water. What could go wrong? It's India. <laughs> and yeah, and don't do it with the plastic bucket either. Do it, you got to make sure you do it with the metal bucket. There was many melted plastic buckets around in Vrindavan at that time. <laughs> but let me, um, let me, now, Eddie, you also, when you first went to Vrindavan, you went to the same ashram, the Nima Karoli Baba ashram, correct? Yeah. And you also met Shamdas there. I did. I did. And, and and also, I met Kabir, Kabir Das, and he was married to a woman named Kamala at that Kamala, time. Kamala, exactly, yeah. A daughter named Rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They were in India then. No, they were from it, Canada. Generally, Indians don't name their kids Rainbow. No, it's a great name. They, you know, Unicorn would have been a second. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought Sham Das, in a sense brought, but you yeah. kind of invited him to your your sent your I don't know if it was just called AYNY at that point. Well, this was pre this was pre Ashtanga Yoga in New York. Um, okay. uh, I met Sham Das in 1990 in Vrindavan, and I had traveled to um, 1991. Uh, I'd already been to Vrindavan a few times at that point, and um, this particular trip was the year I went to study with Patabi Joyce for a month. And I brought Sharon and David from Jeeva Mukti with me to go meet him and study with him. And we were supposed to meet a, um, a Swami in Vrindavan. Sharon had a neck injury, so was going to fly to Delhi with David. And I took the train up to Vrindavan and got sick on the way. And you got what? You know what? I was eating all the train food, you know, and drinking. Oh, you got sick. Okay. That's sick, yeah. Can't eat the train food. It was a 56-hour train ride from where we were. By and the way, he's not joking. It was a 56-hour train ride. <laughs> it sounds like you're just exaggerating. It was like 56 hours. No, it was 56 hours. So I was going to eat the train food. And um, I uh, got to Vrindavan. I was really, really sick. And I uh, went to an ashram there, not the Nidhuli Baba one, a different one and stayed there uh, for about a week or so. And after five days, after I was taking medications and stuff, I started feeling a little bit better. And uh, one day I was uh, out in the main you know, entranceway doing some asana practice 
and I saw this guy walk into the ashram who looked like he was a you know rugby player or something. And um, oh, who's this guy who looks like a rugby player walking into the ashram? And he was talking uh, in uh, in Hindi with the uh, the woman Swami who ran the ran the ashram. And then after a little while, he came back and he started talking to me because I was another white guy in the ashram. And uh, we started talking and. Um, he said, you know, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. I said, I was from New York. And where are you from? From Connecticut. But I lived in India, you know, here in Vrindavan for 10 years, learning language and studying classical singing and music and all that. Um, I thought that maybe it was Bhagavan Das because I had heard about Bhagavan Das who had spent a long time in Vrindavan singing. I asked him his name and he said, no, my name is Sham Das. And um, so I knew some of the Neem Karoli Baba um, people peripherally from reading all of the Maharaji books, yeah. but I had Sam Das's name. So I said, well, you know, uh, why don't you come to the yoga school where I work, Juva Mukti, when you get back to New York? I'm going back in a few weeks. He said he was going back the following month. I said, why don't you come down and, and, um, and teach some classes or do some satsang or something? So he did. He got back to Connecticut. I got back to New York. I called him up. I said, do you want to come down? And he said, sure. And so he came down and that's how he met Jiva Mukti and he met Sharon and David. And um, I think there were two people who came to listen to him sing that first day that he came. And um, that was that. Sharon and David thought he was absolutely nuts out of his mind. They were like, <laughs> 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 uh, and, and back at those times, uh, Jiva Mukti was not oriented towards bhakti. They were oriented towards asanas primarily. Gotcha. Huh. Um, and, um, I, I was super into chanting and, and, and the whole bhakti tradition was where it was at for me. Yeah, that's why I felt so welcome when I got there. It really felt like a home. And so um, that's how Sham Dalsa came to meet everybody in New York. See, and, and so he was, yeah, he was, you know, in, those, in the early 70s there in Vrindavan, uh, along with some of those, you know, if you read books like Be Here Now, and so, you know, you, you can connect with a certain group that was around Neem Karoli Baba. But then Sham also went on to be initiated in the Pushti Marg lineage of Krishna Bhakti. Yeah. Um, and, and so he became, and, and that's a lineage that is just like very parallel to everything that we do here on Wisdom of the Sages. It's based on Bhagavatam, it's Braja Bhakti, it's based on the, you know, that... Based that, on Sweet uh, Baby Krishna. It's based on Sweet Baby Krishna, right, right. And, and so... Yeah, I'm sorry. A very serious bhakta. I mean, his, his entire life was able to, to. Yeah. Um, and so, so now, Mike, you also then, you know, became connected with um, Shamdas and, and connected to Krishna Bhakti through that, connected to Bhagavatam and, and even uh, connected with that lineage. Yeah. Well, I mean, so you couldn't spend time with Shamdas without. I remember fairly early on in terms of just being and learning from Shandas. It was like he he would sort of like a one of the main uh, teachings that we go through often was basically this this the this lawlessness of of you know the real the sort of enrapturing. Um, all-encompassing, love-filled lawlessness of baby Krishna, right? And and to me that really appealed because I look, I'm in like I'm this like enraged hardcore kid ultimately, right? And rapper kid, whatever. Like so, I anything dogma or structure or rule-oriented to me uh, will, will, is is a real repellent. Right. But then here's this guy who's teaching me that, showing me that basically it's just that he's in every cell of his body, in every part of his mind, he's always focused on this kind of this consciousness, on this awareness, on this service, on this gratitude and service or servitude towards his God. Yeah. Um, and that that's that basically that is higher than the law itself. That just that that consciousness uh, supersedes the practices, basically. Right. Um, that, that, even though the practices are part of it, right? Because the practices get you to that 
but ultimately it's meant to I lead meant to towards get you to that, right I that you're pulled by emotion that, right. rather than by than by uh, by dogma or by rules yeah, yeah. But, but 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 Mike uh, 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 okay <laughs> I did. careful Mike careful Eddie set him straight exactly Mike had an initiation from Sham Das yeah. And- and that maybe through Milan Baba as well. Yeah, through Milan Baba, he gave me the. I was initiated into the, to the Pushti Marg tradition and practices. Yeah. And and it, initiation in the Pushti Marg is is, like in in our lineage in the the Gaudiya Vaishnava lineage, you're given especially you're given the mantra. I assume you're given mm-hmm. mantras, but the mantras, yeah. is, is it um in relation to um seva or or deity worship that is. Like when you are initiated and push yeah. the market, it's like you give, you're given deity worship. Is that right? Yeah, you're get, you're, so you're given a mantra and you're also given, um, I'd say, like a directional yeah, yeah. deity worship uh, path. And for you, that was little baby Krishna. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. There you go. Correct. See, we know that Raghunath, deep down, when, when he um, leaves his mortal frame uh, and, and takes on his sarup, his body in the spiritual world, we know it says an elderly gopi in Vrindavan. Not a young one. He's going to be one of these elder ones. Just, <laughs> is an right. elderly, lovely gopi. <laughs> Worshipping <laughs> baby Krishna myself. Right. All right. So did right. you get a name? But, but again, so but exactly, but see, Raghunath, that's part of the lawlessness. Right. It's part, the right? Gopis. They're in this. The the they're in, the they're literally, in, they're literally in the you're, you're in that incarnation. You're going to take on this ecstatic trance. Nobody's going to be able to tell you what to do when you're that old lady. You just do whatever you want. Yeah. Right. M- Mike, did you get a name? Uh, I did. Is it private? Is it a secret? I think I'm supposed. To, yeah, I don't know. Am I supposed? I don't. I don't know. I, free, I like. If, am I supposed to be private or? I not? think it's cool. I think it's cool. I feel kind of. Pro- I don't know. But yeah, <laughs> okay. I was, that was also Keep part of the initiation. Very nice. And you know, it's Shamdas was like he was an amazing character because I could see he um he was he was super intelligent and he was super learned. So he really learned that shastra and. and um, but I remember because, like Eddie introduced introduced me to him at one of these very just cool programs at at a, at a strong, at Broom Street Temple. I should mention that at a certain point, Eddie and I were in New Jersey, um, uh, witnessing the puja of I'm forgetting his name, a Samudra, one of the one of the acharyas from the from the um, f- from uh, why can't I think of it. Uh, with the, uh, it was the Madhva. Madhva, one of the Madhvite. Madhvacharya from Udupi. From Udupi, thank you. Uh, he was in, which actually was controversial that he had left India and was doing a program in, in New Jersey. And you and I were discussing that. And I was just saying something about like how someday I would like to have a little temple kind of scene in downtown New York and, you know, where Kirtan could have. And you're like, well, why don't you just do it with me? And, um, and, and I'm, to this day, I'm very grateful for that. And, and it really facilitated the whole thing financially in terms of space in the temple. And I went to India. I found very beautiful Radha Krishna deities and all, all the paraphernalia needed for the temple. And we built a second temple next to the Ganesh temple, Radha and Krishna temple. Um, and, I, and, in one of the, and, and for me, one of the things that was so special about that time, which was really, you know, about a decade or so worth of time, um, that... In my mind, that was the cool place to find Kirtan in New York City for that time and to find authentic, beautiful ritual. Um, and I was the cook, right? I was squeezed in this tiny little closet, work cooking on two little burn, electric burners and cooking up for like- be there now eating your- uh, <laughs> It was fun. Dokla. It was, yeah, I didn't make dokla there, but I made a lot what of other stuff. I would always make a rice and a sabji and um, halva was sweet. a regular and uh, yeah. different stuff. Yeah, yeah but still, it was amazing that we, you, you would make full prasad. Yeah. <laughs> For up to 80 in, people. In a closet. Yeah. A small closet. <laughs> and Eddie, I have to give you credit and give you props for somehow in this, you know, basically downtown New York loft space, right? You inhabited it with a school, with a temple. And not only that, you also then got this out of this community of New Yorkers and these, you know, ad hoc group you know you would draw like Kasturba would make the meals and Spiros would do the chai and you know you you kind of had right. this like ad hoc group of Village. people that would How just, did I yeah, miss this? make it make it all happen I was in the LA I could have been the rickshaw walla the choky gar <laughs> come on <laughs> oh man 
Well, so Ray, Eddie, Ray, I'm sorry, had... Eddie, Eddie's got you, uh, your, your volume somehow really low. So we're having a little trouble hearing you, Eddie. Ah, sorry. There you go. Yeah. Ragu definitely could have been the guard. Yeah. And, wait, and Ray, you had, you had, you had decamped to LA at that point? Yeah, I did, I did my time. Doesn't everybody do their time in LA? Oh, mm -hmm. I still, I'm still doing it. So oh, you're in LA now. That's right. It's well, crazy. I'm not really that... LA. I'm, you know, I'm a beat. I'm a coastal outlier, but yeah. Where are you? Um, I'm oh, I won't the... gun scratching at your window. Don't I'm, in the weird, <laughs> like uh, I'm in the weird, I'm in the weird cult they call Malibu. Oh, Malibu. Yeah. Ron Maswami goes there every year. Did you, have you seen him there? Mike? Uh, no, I know that, I'm surprised we have it because we have, I'm sure, we certainly have friends in common out here. You know, I'm yeah. surprised our paths haven't crossed in a, in a sauna or ice bath somewhere. Right. <laughs> right. That we had between the Bhakti Center and the Broom Street Temple was a really nice crossover. Um, Definitely. We had these two temples in downtown Manhattan that were like, um, you know, supporting each other and taking part in each other's programs and, you know, devotees were going back and forth between the two temples and it was a really beautiful New York moment for, you know, I mean, we were down here for 20 years before we closed, so. Right. And my first, the first place I taught Ashtanga Yoga in New York City after I left Jiva Mukti, this was in 1993, was at the Hare Krishna Center on St. Mark's Place between Second Avenue and Third Avenue. It was yeah. the precursor to the Bhakti Center. Yeah, amazing, right? Yeah, and the, wow. uh, who was the um, Swami who was in charge of that? Um, was that Kapindra Swami? Kirtananda. Sure. It was Kirtananda. It was Kirtananda. And then Kirtananda. He, and then he okay. was the building on, and I remember when he was given the building on First Avenue. And, oh, okay. Uh, and I was off to India, and they said, yeah, we were given a building. When you get back, this won't be here anymore. Right. That and that became the Bhakti Center eventually after some years. That was the first place I ever taught Ashtanga Yoga. That was such a cool thing because we were coming from, we were learning from different lineages, but we just really together created a really beautiful atmosphere there. And I think it's such an eclectic scene that people could really appreciate, you yeah. know, appreciate the mood. It needs to rise again. We need to, we need to build the Ganesh Temple again. You know, I'm thinking that um, you went to Brooklyn and although it wasn't that deep into Brooklyn, it was just a hard place to get to in Brooklyn, you know? It wasn't close to anything. It was. And, and, um, and now you're back in Manhattan, but COVID set in, so I still can't see you. <laughs> although, yeah, Eddie, I would say, like, an interesting flip to that, because that, since I'm in California here with my uh, kids, that yeah. actually it's great. I get to see Eddie now. We've been, we, we, we have a, a, a practice where we get together, and, my, and Eddie is now my my teenage boys, Ashtanga Ooh, yoga teacher okay. as well. It's kind of great. Yeah, so thank you, Eddie. My pleasure. So in this weird way that COVID has brought us back closer together. Thanks, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be optimistic here. Give the silver lining. That's, that's, that's right. Um, you know, I think what is sort of cool with you, Mike, is you're sort of like, what? <laughs> is that a landline? Is that like a landline telephone? Not landlines. <laughs> wow. This is no Impressive. It's not a dial, though. Um, you know, it's cool that you had your band member. Did you, all your band members go through a spiritual shift together? Uh, together and individually. You know, I mean, like, Yauk yeah. had his experiences of going, uh, you know, Yauk went off to, I think, kind of similar to my arc, like he just sort of like heard or pr prior to when I went to India, like, so this was like maybe a good, probably like a solid like four years or so prior to that had gone. He, you know, I forget, we had like a break and he just went off to Nepal and then he was, uh, and then he went, and then from there he ended up checking through the Himalayas and, and in, in checking through the Himalayas that he met, uh, uh, diasporatic Tibetans, you know, that they were all, and then they were like, well, we, and then realized that they started talking to them and they all lived in, in India. And it's like, well, why are you living in India? Why are you living where you come from? And they, you know, explained the situation that basically if they were to practice what they practiced where they come from, they would actually be horribly persecuted. And so they're, they had to resettle. Um, 
in India and there's, you know, his hook entire mind was blown. And not only that, but then also all these practices sort of, you know, availed themselves to him. And, and then he became a very serious uh, student and, and practitioner of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but, and then, you know, then with Horvitz, like he always had, then it was really interesting. I think he, you know, he really became an advocate um, it's social justice ways, like really still is like this, I think, uh, uh, in our group a voice of consciousness on, on the, the, the part of uh, equality for, for an advocate for uh, women at all times and, and angles. And that's something that, you know, really spoke, you know, that's sort of his bhakti. Is, and, and so, um, yeah, it was great that we all were sort of able to kind of bring find these different things and bring them back into the group with each other. I mean, I think that was like, I really, if I look back at it, that was like our, the unique, very, very unique thing that we got to have and share. Okay. Is that it? That's now we have Kirtan. Song. Now we have Kirtan, this is how we end it. But I wanna thank Mike D and Eddie Stern, you guys are inspirational and fun, and I feel like it's a reunion that we never, never had because we were never initially reunion, except that one magic moment, Mike. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Which, uh, of course. which, to be honest, Ray, I'm just be full disclosure. I don't remember at all, but I had a lot going on at the time. <laughs> okay, but I, but you do, right? You really do. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. Thanks for doing. I want. Do. I want to say. We, I want to bring Eddie back too because I really want to talk about Eddie's book. So, Eddie, can we do that sometime soon? Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to. Thank you. Okay. Let's make sure. And Mike D, I just you text me your address. I'm gonna be the guy scratching on your window. We're gonna go surfing in Malibu. Okay, great. We're gonna do some jujitsu and wrestle together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, believe me, we have now, during COVID times now. We yeah, jujitsu is like a big part of our house because uh, my kids can't go to their school anymore. So it's there. Anyway, Did they go to Jean Jacques School in Malibu. No, they, he, you know, he sadly had to close in Malibu. He only has the, the well, I now who knows what all about, but he had, he only has the Valley one open now. That's, uh, yeah, that's but true. yeah, they're, yes, they love their, their Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And thanks to everybody joining us live on a weird time. We had 109 people live on Zoom. And then we have thousands that listen later, but thanks for joining us live. It makes it more fun seeing all these faces. Really honored you guys. I know you guys have busy schedules, busy life, and you guys came. Pastuba, it's always glad to have your company. Hello. Lifts me up. And Mara, here's your chance, Mara. Come on, rap for Mike D. You've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs>